Hello, everybody. Here we go. Happy Friday. It's that time again. Matt Connerton Unleashed, and we are live from the studios of WMNH 95.3 FM in glorious, a uh, little slippery, <laughs> downtown Manchester, New Hampshire. Also on Comcast 97 if you're in Manchester. And hello to all of our online listeners across the nation and around the globe. And you can go to my website, mattconnerton.com, for all of your live streaming options, social media links, contact info, show archives, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, Today is a Friday, February 4, 2000. 22. Now, I do want to remind you all, of course, that we are proudly sponsored by the Hopknot. However, don't go there today. Uh, they are closed uh, because of the weather. It uh, The weather outside is frightful. I know we usually uh, say that uh, for, uh, well, no, that's not necessarily a Christmas song, is it? Actually, we hear it with Christmas music, but uh, I guess it could really be Let It Snow. It could be for uh, any any day of winter. <laughs> Although, personally, I'm not a fan of uh, the snow or of the winter, but um, but the hop knot is closed today, and uh, I'm sure they'll be open tomorrow. Uh, although, if you are local here in Manchester, uh, the snow emergency is continuing tonight, so uh, try to get your cars off of the street so you don't get towed away. But um, yeah, it's uh, so the hop knot is closed, but I assume they'll be open all weekend. Of course, they've got the delicious gourmet pretzels. They have an assortment of craft beer. They have Thursday night. Uh, Thursday nights they have uh, trivia night hosted by the great Bill Cini, who also does trivia on the morning show. And uh, great place. Uh, they've got the Gender Blender event coming up this weekend. Uh, oh wow, actually that's tomorrow, February fifth. That'll be tomorrow night. So hopefully the weather's good. I think um, you know everything should be. Uh, cleaned up by morning. So, yeah, if you're local here in Manchester, I can tell you it. Um, uh, come in here. I, I didn't have a problem getting here, you know, I, but I don't have far to go either. I mean, you know, door to door, I can be here in under 10 minutes. Um, and actually, I've done it in as little as five minutes if, you know, I get all, if I get lucky and it's all green lights coming here. But um, the roads are a bit greasy, I would say. And uh, I had to, to scrape some ice off of the car, but I also, I was fortunate. So I left, I left early just in case I ran into trouble or if I had to go really slow and I did go somewhat slowly, but, um, but I got here, uh, I parked the car and then right after I parked and I'm, I'm heading, you know, from the car to the uh, building here, uh, the freezing rain started up again. <laughs> so it's like, Oh, my timing was perfect. I got here. Uh, just in time to uh, avoid the freezing rain. So there you go. So uh, everybody uh, locally here or wherever you are, this is a big storm. So actually, wherever you're listening from, there's an excellent chance that you're dealing with uh, this current storm system. But I hope everyone is safe and sound. And, um, you know, by the time I leave here tonight, because it's Friday, so it's my long day here at WMNH. Not that I mind. I love it. But um because tonight we have Retro Spectrum Radio at 7.30. But by the time I leave here tonight, things should be pretty well cleaned up, I would hope. And uh, and we'll see. But yes, Retro Spectrum Radio returning live tonight at 7.30 p.m., hosted by the great Paul E.C. And I have the honor and privilege of being one of Paul's co-hosts on that show every Friday night from 7.30 to 10 p.m. But uh, Paul wasn't here last couple of weeks. He was out with the covid So he does return tonight uh, healthy and happy and really looking forward to that. It might be just the two of us. We're not sure. Uh, We're typically also joined by Dan Randlett and DJ Steve. But with road conditions being hazardous, we're not sure uh, either of them will be here. Uh, Where Dan lives, he's uh, he's further out. He's he's kind of on the edge of Manchester. So it's a little more of a drive for him. Like I said, for me to get here is not uh, too difficult. And Paul if I'm not mistaken, lives really close. So for him, it's very easy. But uh, for Dan, it's a little trickier, and and I'm not sure uh, about uh, DJ Steve. But Nemi in the chat room says, only 44 days until spring. All right. (laughs) You know, I think of, to me, it's even less. And I'll tell you why. And if my dad's listening, he'll appreciate this. So growing up, my dad told me that he liked to think of, of winter and it's just a psychological thing, but he likes to think of winter as being only two months long, January and February, and that's it. Uh, because if you think about it, most of December is actually still fall. And then, uh, you know, it's really just the last week of December that's winter. 
So then you've got January and February to contend with. But then once you get to March, you know, depends on the year. Some years it, it warms up right away and it gets really nice. And some years uh, winter just kind of continues. You know, sometimes March will be every bit as uh, wintry as February was. But, you know, even if, even if winter just continues uh, into March, you don't care at that point because you know that any day now spring's going to show up, right? So, so he's always thought of uh, spring as being March 1st. March 1st is the first day of spring, and I uh, have uh, adapted that as well. So I also think of it that way. March 1st is the first day of spring. So in my mind, uh, spring is really, um, I'm not good at math, 24 days away, 23 days away. Only a few weeks, really. So so we're almost there. It's almost spring. That's how I think of it. That's how my dad thinks of it. So there you go. Um, and the winters here have gotten easier, it seems like, than when I, when I was a kid. This hasn't been a terribly bad one. I mean, we've had some very cold days here, but we've also had some very mild days here and really not a lot of snow. It's been more ice, more ice than snow, which in some ways is worse. But uh, if you'd like to give me a call today, of course, uh, 603-250-6007 is the number, 603-250-6007. You can also text me at 617-917-4476, tweet me at Matt Connerton, or send an email to Matt at mattconnerton.com. And of course, you can opine and interact in the Facebook live chat. But the best thing to do so that we may hear and enjoy your dulcet tones is to give us a call at 603-250-6007. Would love to hear from you on this afternoon. Uh, a couple of programming notes. Coming up today uh, at the top of the hour, uh, around 5 p.m., we will share with you Eric Pilcher's classic film review. And this week he has reviewed In the Heat of the Night, which I'm excited about. I've already listened to it. It's very good. The, uh, the review is excellent. Eric does a great job, which is why it's become such a popular segment on the show. But um, one of my top five, easily in my top five all-time favorite movies, I love In the Heat of the Night, Sidney Portier as Tibbs and uh, Rod Steiger as Gillespie, just perfection. It's If you've never seen it, you owe it to yourself to see it. And if you haven't seen it, and you're on the fence about it, perhaps Eric's review of the film will convince you. But uh, Jenny and I watched it a year or two ago. She had never seen it. She had only seen the show. I've probably seen the movie seven or eight times. I just absolutely love it. So uh, so that will be the classic film review coming up coming up at 5 p.m. And Eric is, um, for the month of February, he has uh, chosen films uh, specifically that he feels are appropriate uh, for uh, Black History Month. Uh, I know one of them coming up is Menace to Society, and uh, the other one is uh, 12 Years a Slave, where uh, two that he mentioned to me in a message that he's going to be reviewing this month. So we look forward to that. So that will be coming up today at 5 p.m. Of course, uh, tonight from 7 to 9 p.m., Jenny is on The Charles Richardson Show, as she is every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 7 to 9. And as I mentioned right here at WMNH, will be Retro Spectrum Radio from 7.30 to 10 p.m., and uh, like I said, I'm glad I won't have to go anywhere until, you know, later <laughs> when the, when hopefully the roads are clear and sanded and salted and everything. But they've done a good job here. They've done a good job. So lots going on. One other quick programming note, and then we'll move on to some stuff. Uh, but I did share out uh, a little bit ago. Last night, I was making my monthly appearance on The Dr. Kevin Show. Uh, the first Thursday of every month, I uh, as soon as I get done here, I call into his program and, uh, and we uh, chat for, uh, for an hour from 6 to 7 p.m. The first Thursday of the month about politics. We just kind of, uh, in many cases, it's just a continuation of whatever I was discussing here. So I did share the archive of that out. So if you missed it, uh, that is uh, up and available. So, uh, you know, if you, if you need a little bit more, if you want an extra hour of Matt Connerton in your life, uh, that's the way that you can get it. So, and one other thing too, uh, by the way, if you are, um, if you were listening to the weekly die on here last night at WMNH, uh, they announced, actually they announced it on my show too. Uh, they came in early and, and we chatted about it a bit, Ben and Daryl die on, uh, they are ending their show for now. So that was the final weekly die on uh, here at WMNH 95.3, at least for, for now. I would not be surprised if it comes back in the future. And, you know, they're leaving on really good terms. There's no issues or anything like that. It's just Ben is so busy. He's got so much going on both professionally and, you know, he and his wife have a 
a adorable young son, uh, Lincoln. So, you know, he's got a lot of irons in the fire, so he's going to step away from the show for now. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if it comes back. Or if not here at WMNH, maybe it resumes as a podcast where he's not committed to a, a strict uh, broadcasting schedule or something like that. But, um, you know, but, uh, you know, sorry to sorry to see those guys, uh, those guys go. But I have a feeling they'll be back. And, of course, you know, they're always welcome to pop in on this program. So although I don't think anybody will be popping in unexpected today, uh, given the it's funny, I'm looking out at Elm Street here and there's barely any traffic at this point. Like I said, I think I kind of dodged a bullet with my timing uh, when I came in today. It was wise of me to get here a little bit early but let me give the number again and then i want to say hello to everybody in the facebook live chat 603-250-6007 603-250-6007 eric pilcher uh eric we were just talking about you of course well you heard that because you're listening <laughs> eric with this classic film review he is also in the facebook live chat joining us all the way from cedar rapids iowa and he said, now this is regarding the, this is in reference to the end of the morning show. I usually start the Facebook live feed a few minutes early. So those of you who tune in on the Facebook, you end up getting the tail end of the morning show. Of course, the morning show with Peter White weekdays from 7 to 9 a.m. with a replay from 2 to 4 p.m. right before this show. And uh, Eric, it seems, was responding to, and we did play it the other day on this show too. Actually, it was yesterday. Uh, the duet, which... It's only a matter of time until this is charting in Billboard. Uh, the uh, the duet of uh, Glenn R.J. Willette and Meatloaf doing two out of three ain't bad. And uh, I'll tell you, the two of them together, wow. I mean, just, you know, what else can you say, really? I, I told Glenn afterward, I, I played it yesterday. I said, Glenn, that was something. He really puts his heart into it. Uh, Eric, I'm not sure, cared for it as much, he said, because they also played it at the end of the morning show. That's where Eric heard it. And he said, uh, listening to this, I now know what it sounds like when an animal is neutered without being put out, LOL. Well, that's, uh, you know, I mean, that's one interpretation. You know, uh, may, uh, you know, maybe, maybe in addition to a classic film review, maybe we should get Eric to review all of the music of Glenn R.J. Willette, the people's mayor. <laughs> Jenny joins us in the chat, of course, and says, Shalom, peeps. Easy G, Eric Gagnon joins us and says, I hope you are feeling better. I'm not sure who you're talking to, uh, uh, Easy G, but uh, whoever it is that is ill, I hope you're feeling better. And so does Eric. Uh, Eric Gagnon also says, It's Brock Lesnar Friday. I didn't realize that. Wow. Happy Brock Lesnar Friday, everybody. We got a lot going on in February around here. We've got Black History Month. We have Valentine's Day, and apparently we have Brock Lesnar Friday. Very exciting. Nemi Jones joins us in the Facebook live chat. Hello, Nemi. Uh, she says, glad y'all are safe slash dry. Yes, I'm happy to report it is, it is both safe and dry here at WMNH, and I hope everyone listening is safe and dry. And if you are driving, and of course there are people listening to this while they drive during their afternoon commute, I hope you are uh, being very, very careful. Uh, Eric Pilcher says, I'm freezing, Nemi. Apparently in Iowa, it is also uh, wintry. Eric says it's currently 8 degrees, negative 12 wind chill. Yikes. Mike Palapita joins us in the chat. Mike, of course, from another one of our great sponsors here at WMNH, Queen City Cabinetry in the historic Sunbeam Mall. Hello, Mike. Uh, also, Rocky Huber joins us and says, what's up, family? Uh, Nemi says, it's still coming down here. Uh, was a great day to curl up with Coco and Futurama and slog through some reports. Futurama, that's a show I haven't seen in a long time. Is That's not still in first run, I assume. Maybe it is. I don't. Futurama, it seems like, if memory serves, that's one of those shows that got canceled and then brought back and then canceled again, and maybe it ended up on another network or something. Uh, I, I might be wrong. Um... And uh, Nemi likes the dulcet tones, of course, yes. Charles Richardson also now using that on the Charles Richardson show. <laughs> Let's see. Eric uh, Pilcher says, uh, again, this is regarding in the in the heat of the night, uh, Sidney Portier not getting a nomination for Best Actor is a crime. That surprised me. I didn't even realize that, Eric, until I was listening. You know, I always preview the uh, film review. And I did not realize that until today, that he wasn't even nominated. That is a crime. 
Uh, I'm curious if Rod Steiger was. Um, they both should have been. Wayne Noel from the great state of Michigan says, Afternoon all. Hello, Wayne. Um, Tom Blanchard joins us in the chat. Tom says, I love it when my neighbor can't get up his driveway, so he parks his giant van directly across my driveway so that I couldn't get out even if I wanted to. Well, Tom, I, I would say your neighbor is quite rude. I wouldn't put up with that. I mean, I don't know what you should do about it exactly, but I wouldn't put up with that. Uh, yeah, Eric says, uh, Eric Pilcher says, Rod Steiger won for Best Supporting Actor, but Sidney Portier wasn't even nominated for Best Actor? That's crazy. Wow, I did not realize that, and that is uh, that is stunning to me. That is stunning. Um, let's see. We've got a, a few things. Uh, Jenny just sent me something. This is regarding uh, Mike Pence. You might be familiar with uh, Mike Pence, uh, uh, former uh, vice president. Uh, this is from CNN. Pence says Trump is wrong to say then vice president had the right to overturn the 2020 election. You know, we've been learning more and more about this and what the plans were and these uh, executive orders that were drafted to seize voting machines and, and this and that. And uh, Trump recently, uh, again, saying, uh, I think at one of his rallies, was at the rally in Arizona, uh, talking about how the vice president uh, didn't do what he should have done to overturn the election, which is not to say, by the way, that uh, Vice President Mike Pence could not have wreaked havoc uh, he could have. I mean, there there seems to be, you know, there's various, uh, there seem to be various ideas that were um, that were uh, being discussed about how uh, Pence could uh, really uh, screw up the whole thing. For example, if Pence, and this would have triggered a constitutional crisis, right? Pence could have said, "I refuse to uh, acknowledge." Or I refuse to certify the results. Certify might not be the right word. What would be the right word? Maybe maybe it is certify. But I refuse to accept the results from these states, and the states would be the ones that Biden won, where maybe they had previously been uh, won by Republican candidates and so forth, where maybe um, some people could be convinced that there was an issue, right, or, or some sort of irregularities. And if Pence, Pence could have said, I refuse to, um, until further review, I, I refuse to accept uh, the delegates from these states and therefore uh, refuse to, by, by refusing to acknowledge those and therefore not certifying the election, he could have, again, there's all kinds of theories, but he could have thrown the election to the House of Representatives, you know, because... If he refuses to acknowledge those delegates, neither candidate has 270, it goes to the House, and then the Republican-controlled House could have just all voted for Trump, and then that would be it. Um, I mean, that that's one possibility. There, there, there were several of them that apparently were being discussed and even uh, drawn out in PowerPoint presentations. Of course, uh, one of the more interesting ones to me, I remember uh, conspiracy theorists at the time were really into this idea that uh, the vice president would be presented with two envelopes. And I guess if he chose one envelope, Biden would be elected. But if he chose the other envelope, it would be Trump or something. And then he has a choice. I mean, the whole thing, even if there were a way to do this legally under the Constitution, the whole notion... I mean, think about the implications of that, right? What if Pence actually did have that power and he could have made that choice and it would have been legal? That would mean that after any election, the vice president, any presidential election, the vice president, whoever was the sitting vice president at the time, because they have to go and certify the election and preside over that, they could just pick, you know, and, and you would have a single party rule for infinity, right? Because Every administration, the vice president could just pick whichever candidate they wanted to win. And then, you know, I mean, it, it's, you know, the absurdity of it is uh, boundless. But, um, you know, but but Trump uh, doubles down. 
Eric Pilcher points out in the chat, he also said he would consider at the Arizona rally, this was at, I believe, he also said he would consider pardons for those that are prosecuted for taking part in the January 6th Capitol attacks. Yeah. I mean, just, you know. <laughs> there there may be some growing discontent with uh, Trump, though, uh, among Republicans. We'll, we'll see. And, and maybe we'll get to that. I have something on that. But, um, but this is what, again, this is uh, from CNN. Former Vice President Mike Pence called out his former boss by name today. Ooh, wow. It's almost like... Uh, the uh, former vice president finally uh, <laughs> finally got a little bit of courage. <laughs> I mean, he, you know, it's funny. He was willing to stand up to Trump and not uh, try to uh, manipulate the election, right? But he, but then ever since then, he like tiptoes around, and you know, he's very afraid to. You know, he says things. He soft pedals it. He says things like, "What did he say at that one event? You know the." Uh, President Trump and I, we might never see eye to eye on the events of January 6th, but I'm so proud to have been his vice president and this and that, you know, because he doesn't want to anger uh, all the people who still support Trump, right? Even though, I mean, it's amazing. Pence, who wants to be president, and he wants to be president so badly that he has to thread this needle where, you know, on the one hand, he can't admit Trump is right because if he says, well, yeah, I probably should have uh, done that. I guess I made a mistake. Oh, my bad. I should have given the uh, awarded the uh, election to Trump. He can't say that. Right. But he also can't do anything that's going to anger Trump too much because he doesn't want to anger Trump's supporters. You know, because as I've been saying on the show, Trump, in my mind, is the presumptive nominee for 2024. He's almost certainly running, and if he runs, he will be the nominee. And he may be our next president <laughs> again. Yikes! But, uh, so this is all possible. But but watching, I mean, I feel sorry for Mike Pence. Uh, the uh, Watching him, the as he tries to thread this needle, I mean... Look, they were, uh, I, I know uh, people, some people like to dispute, you know, the severity of what happened on January 6th, but I, they were chanting, hang Mike Pence, right? So this guy, the former vice president, knowing that, knowing that they were chanting, hang Mike Pence, knowing that they brought a guillotine, whether it was symbolic or whether they were actually going to use it, I don't want to have that argument again, but I'm just saying, this is fact. They did bring a guillotine. They were chanting, hang Mike Pence. And then watching Mike Pence have to, you know, tiptoe around and try not to say anything too, uh, I don't know, too critical of the events of that day and try to almost downplay it like it wasn't that big a deal after he and his family had to be whisked away for their own protection, you know, it, it's like, uh, it's just so emasculated. Like, like, what kind of a man would would just act like, oh, you know, it was no big deal as, you know, my family and I, you know, we could have been killed that day, but uh, I don't want to upset. I don't want to upset my former boss or any of his supporters. So I'm just going to tread very lightly on this. I mean, you know, I I, I mean, anatomically, that dude's got to be a Ken doll, right? Am I, am I, so, you know, I've just lost, not that I had a lot of respect for him to begin with, but... But now, at least he, you know, I don't know, maybe he had a testosterone injection or something because apparently today he managed to actually say the words. He actually, Mike Pence, actually said the words, President Trump is wrong, quote unquote. President Trump is wrong in claiming that Pence had the right to overturn the 2020 election on January 6, 2021. What? I, hey, that's progress. That's progress. Usually he'd be like, well, you know, the former vice president and I, we don't necessarily see eye to eye, but my good God golly, was I proud to be his vice president. <laughs> you know, that's usually what he would say. But, uh, you know, he, he actually came right out and said, President Trump is wrong? I mean, that's, uh, Wow. I mean, look, the guy's never going to be president. I mean, there's a large swath of the Republican Party that has such an intense loathing for for Mike Pence because he didn't even try to overturn the election for Trump. They're never going to support him. So uh, why, he should just, you know, he used to be a political talk radio guy. Did you know that? 
he used to, you know, before he was a, a politician, he worked in political talk radio. He was a conservative talk show host. He should just go back to that. Although I don't know if anyone would hire him. I, I don't know. Where does he go? Where does Mike Pence go? He has nowhere to go. I, I think his political career is over. They'll never accept him. Uh, you know, unless they all start turning on Trump, they're never going to accept Mike Pence. He is a villain to to, to many Republicans. Uh, it says here, speaking at the Federalist Society Florida Chapters Conference near Orlando, well, that sounds like a rollicking good time, Pence delivered his strongest response yet. <laughs> Wait, let me just stop here for a second. How, I mean, how pathetic is it that that him simply saying that Trump is wrong in claiming that Pence could overturn the election, that qualifies as his strongest response yet. Just saying, well, President Trump was wrong about that. That's his strongest response yet. <laughs> that's the best. That's the, that's the best he can do. That's the most he dare muster, right? Anyway, uh, Pence delivered his strongest response yet to Trump's ongoing efforts to relitigate the 2020 presidential election calling it un-American to suggest one person could have decided the outcome. Ooh, is he calling President Trump un-American? No, no, no. He's just suggest- He's just saying it, it's un-American to suggest that. He, he would not dare actually call daddy un-American. He wouldn't go that far. Uh, Pence warned against conservatives who continue to insist the vice president can alter an election and said it could be a problematic position for Republicans in the next presidential contest. He said, quote, under the Constitution, I had no right to change the outcome of our election. And Kamala Harris will have no right to overturn the election when we beat them in 2024, unquote. Who's this we? (laughs) There's there's no we here, uh. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Former Vice President. Uh, Pence's remarks come after Trump asserted on Sunday that his then Vice President, quote, did have the right to change the outcome and could have overturned the election, unquote. Well, he's, uh, Mike Pence is just, just little by little. He's, uh, uh, like I said, pretty sure that's a, he's a walking Ken doll, if you know what I mean. Um, let's see, got some more, uh, great comments in the chat room. Let's look at those. But if you'd like to call in 603-250-6007, 603-250-6007, um, Nemi points out that's gotta be tampering what, yeah, that's been a discussion too. what Trump said at the Arizona rally about, uh, considering pardoning the January 6th rioters. I like to say insurrectionist, but some people get prickly about that. To me, I mean, I, I stand by that word, but I'll, out of deference for those who, you know, don't want to hear that, I'll, I'll, I'll call them rioters. Um, the, uh, anyway, yeah, so Trump said, uh, what, what, what does Trump call them, by the way? He doesn't call them either, of course. What does he call them, patriots? I don't know. Anyway, Whatever Trump's, uh, but, but he does say they've been treated very unfairly. He did say that they, they've been treated very unfairly because, you know, apparently when you uh, injure 140 police officers and you, you know, uh, uh, you, you crush a Capitol police officer in a door and you uh, poke someone's eye out and you uh, it, all of these things, you know, you really I mean, maybe a fine or something. Right. I guess. Would, would that be OK with him? Do you think? No, of course not. It was it was all in service to their uh, their Messiah, Donald John Trump. But uh, anyway, so him him saying that that he would consider pardoning them, uh, couldn't that be construed as as witness tampering? Um, you know, or <laughs> or or hey, you know, stick with me and I'll I'll make sure you get a pardon when I'm president again. I I don't know. Um. Isaiah Aline joins us in the Facebook live chat. Isaiah, of course, the Illuminati candidate in uh, 2024 for the uh, presidential election. Now, if you're a regular listener, you know that he's invited me to be his veep. And I will I will pledge right now uh, that if Isaiah does become president and I am his vice president, I will not 
overturn, you know, when we're running for our second term. If we lose, which I think is highly unlikely, I will not do anything to overturn the election. Uh, I will uh, gracefully accept uh, that we that we lost. But I think we're going to be, I you know, if I do accept his invitation and we run together, I think we'll, we will easily have uh, two terms or more. Uh, perhaps we will... Um, Perhaps we'll refuse to leave and, and stick around for additional terms. Even uh, um, no, I'm I'm kidding about that. No, we'll 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 do two terms though. I, I have no doubt. Respect, Isaiah says. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Tom Blanchard says there's something in the news about the voting machines were wrong. It cost a million dollars to figure it out. Well, no, the what 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 you might have been hearing in the news, Tom, is uh, you know there were these uh, executive orders that were drafted. But, you know, Trump hit a couple of brick walls uh, with that. Uh, one of them named uh, Bill Barr, his attorney general, who said, you can't do this. And the other one, uh, Ken Cuccinelli, who was running the um, Homeland Security, uh, who said, uh, you can't do this. Uh, but, yeah, there were a couple of executive orders drafted that they would have either had the military seize the voting machines uh, in states where Trump lost or what was or, or the National Guard in, in, in those individual states. And, they, you know, they would have gotten, you know, in, in states with Republican governors, they would have tried to get those governors to have the guard uh, seize the voting machines, have the Justice Department seize the voting machines. There, there were a few different uh, ideas here. And um, but these executive orders, they were drafted. We know they exist, but they were never acted upon because. Uh, Trump was told, uh, no, I mean, Bill Barr, who certainly a Trump loyalist by all indications, but at the end, you know, he, he got out of town early. Remember he resigned. He didn't even want to stick around for the, uh, for the end of the administration. I think he saw what was coming. I don't mean he literally knew what was going to happen January 6th, but I think he saw trouble and I think he got very uncomfortable and didn't want to finish his career that way. Um, uh, but yeah, but you know, he he refused to toe the line on 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 the big lie as they call it, this election fraud thing. He he came right out and said, "Look, there's no evidence of widespread voter fraud, certainly not on the scale that would alter this election in any way." Uh he said there's nothing there. And that was coming from Bill Barr, very loyal to Trump. And like I said, Ken Cuccinelli, he wouldn't go along with this either. So, um Rocky Huber says, to appease both sides, I would have certified the election but called for an investigation into the claims of voter fraud. Yeah, I mean, you could. Well, you know, they have investigated voter fraud, and they have found some. Uh, for example, uh, in the state of Pennsylvania, I think they found a whopping four cases of voter fraud. Oh, yes, uh, they were Trump voters, in fact, who voted illegally in Pennsylvania. So, you know, it does exist. Uh, Eric Pilcher says there is an undercurrent with Republicans that Trump cannot keep saying these things and that it is not going to help the party. Well, I hope that's I hope that's true, Eric. I you know, I I I always wonder. I mean, polling data shows Trump is likely to be the nominee if he runs again. So I I wonder where, you know, like wh where is the line? What is the limit for for Republicans as far as what Trump can say and do? You know, um, because every time it's like he he says something and you go, okay, well that's going too far, and yet he still continues to be uh, the 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 king of the Republican Party, right? He's still the most powerful Republican in the United States. Um, Nemi in the chat says, LOL, Pence will never be president. That is true. He will not. Eric Pilcher says, there were investigations. Pence did exactly what he was supposed to do with the facts that he had. Absolutely. Uh, Nemi says, uh, like Ted Cruz thanking the guy for insulting his wife, LOL. Oh, yeah, Ted Cruz, another, uh, another uh, living, breathing Ken doll uh, anatomically. Uh, Ted Cruz, well, now, Ted... Ted had a flash, just like Pence had a brief flash of courage, where he managed to stand up to Pen to uh, Trump long enough uh, not to go along with flipping the election. Ted Cruz had a brief flash of courage too. When the one there, look, there's one moment in time where I actually genuinely liked Ted Cruz, senator from Texas. There's one moment in time where I actually enjoyed watching him on television. It was during the 20, uh, 2016 Republican convention. 
He gets up. He gives his speech, but he never endorses Trump by name. And and remember, this is after this is after Trump uh, said these terrible insults, these schoolyard insults, like for example, uh, calling uh, Ted Cruz's wife um, Heidi Heidi Cruz, uh, insinuating on Twitter that she was ugly, which. Not only is that, you know, just completely classless, um, and uh, but but also too, um, I've met Heidi Cruz. You know, when I was Gary Hopper's co-host on Rock Paper Hand Grenades at that time, uh, we couldn't get Ted Cruz on the show, but Heidi Cruz came and appeared on the show, and she's she seemed like a very nice person, delightful, and 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 she's not ugly at all, very attractive, really nice. Uh, we all enjoyed speaking with her. Obviously, I don't agree with her husband politically on many things, but I enjoyed our interview with her, and she just just seemed like a really great person. And, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, she did not deserve uh, to be called ugly by Donald Trump on Twitter, right? So um, so Ted Cruz, you know, he did that, that one thing where he said, and somebody in the media, he said, Donald, you leave my family the hell alone or something. And then he he goes to the convention, he gives his speech, and he he I'm telling you, he knew what he was doing. I could see it in his face. The crowd is getting angry. As his speech goes on, the crowd is getting restless. They're getting impatient. It gets to a point where they're actually chanting. The crowd actually starts chanting, say his name, say his name, because Cruz wouldn't do it. He went right up to the line. It sounded like at the very end, it sounded like he might actually do it, and he might say, and so I officially endorse Donald Trump for president. But he never quite does it. Even as even as this crowd, they're all chanting in unison, say his name, say his name. Which isn't even the least bit cult-like, by the way, because some people get, you know, upset when I call MAGA a cult. I mean, I'm speaking hyperbolically. It's not a literal cult. It's not like Trump, you know, hangs out wearing white robes and, and uh, you know, like uh, David Koresh or something. And You know, it's not a literal. I mean, I'm being somewhat hyperbolic, but it does have certain cult-like features, shall we say, and that's one of them. When you've got an arena full of people chanting, say his name, um... That seems very culty to me. So anyway, but Cruz, in that moment, Cruz would not give in. He wouldn't do it. And I'm telling you, I could see it in his face. He was enjoying himself. He was enjoying not giving them what they wanted because they insulted his wife. He insulted, rather. He insulted his, Trump insulted his wife. Oh, I remember what the other thing was, too, now. Trump uh, implied that, insinuated, I should say, that uh, Ted Cruz's father, Rafael Cruz, uh, helped murder JFK. That was the other thing. That one's, you almost can't get mad at that one because that's so bizarre. But to to call uh, Heidi Cruz ugly, that's that's really just extremely uncool and and, uh, not appropriate. And Cruz wouldn't do it. He never said Trump's name during that speech. And he looked like he was enjoying himself. He's he he kept walking right up to the line like he was going to do it. And he was playing with them. He was playing with the people in that crowd and he was enjoying it. And I was enjoying watching him do that. I thought that was fun. And for that one moment, I actually liked Ted Cruz. Now, of course, though, uh, we all know what happened next. Right. So he does that. He gets out of there so he doesn't get strangled by these people who are chanting, say his name. Again, nothing cultish about that, right? Then he goes, and I think it was in the same building, actually. He goes to visit the Mercer family. If, you don't, if you're not familiar with the Mercers, they're very powerful donors. A lot of money uh, that they uh, dole out for Republican campaigns. You know, Rebecca Mercer and family. Rebecca Mercer, the way the story goes, if I remember correctly, he goes to see them. Because you have to. You have to go see the Mercers if you're a Republican. You got to kiss their ring and then they give you a bunch of money, right? He goes to see Rebecca Mercer and she slams the door in his face. Not figuratively, literally, if the accounts are correct. 
She slams the door in his face because she was so angry that he would not say his name during the speech. So then what happens? Next thing you know, guess who's in love with Donald Trump? Ted Cruz, of course. Once he realized that he may have just self-immolated in front of the world, he had no choice. He had no choice. He had to suck it up. And he had to fall in love with Trump, just like the rest of them. And there you go. And so there was the emasculation of Ted Cruz, which does have certain par- uh, parallels with the emasculation of uh, Mike Pence. Thank you for reminding us uh, about that, Nemi. Uh, Nemi says, electioneering is something my brain's tired today, but pardons for votes is. Um, I don't know. I'm going to need to hear about your pony policies. Oh, yes. Well, um, I don't know. Maybe Isaiah can uh, answer that for you, Nemi. Uh, of course, um, I'm sure that, you know, whatever Vermin Supreme is proposing, we can, uh, we can, uh, propose something even grander. And then he, and then he says, uh, toothbrushing ought to be a law on that. I agree. Uh, Nemi says there was a whole subdivision of elderly sunburn prone Republicans in Florida that got strung up, that got strung up for it. If I remember correctly. Um. Oh, and there's an article there. I'll 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 come back and look at that. By the way, uh, Wayne Noel shared an article in the uh, Facebook live chat as well about Michael Avenatti. Avinat- yeah, we might get to that today too. Uh, apparently, uh, Michael Avenatti has been convicted of fraud. Um, you know, he represented uh, Stormy Daniels. I thought Michael Avenatti at the time was uh, in the early days of the Trump administration. I was sure that he was going to end up with his own show on MSNBC. He was on there like every night. And then he got into trouble. So he got, well, he got into trouble for a couple different things. Not not just uh, Stormy Daniels and fraud, but there was also, he tried to he tried to extort Nike or something for millions of dollars. Uh, let's see. Uh, Nemi says, it's like you're telling the story of Chris Cantwell, LOL. Cantwell, of course, uh, also known as the crying Nazi. Oh, Texas Mike joins us in the uh, Facebook live chat. Hello, uh, Texas Mike. And he says, uh, so excited to see Brad Williams perform tonight in Boston at the Wilbur Theater. Very nice. Very nice. Um, Oh, Nemi says he's hilarious. I I assume referring to Brad Williams. uh, Be super stoked. Have a great time. I can't quite place him, Brad Williams. Uh, the name's familiar, but it's kind of a generic-sounding name, so of course it would be. I don't think I'm familiar with him. Let's see, what time do we have here? Oh, wow, time is flying by. So, uh, Pence, uh, that's, uh, you know, breaking with Trump a little bit to the extent that he's, um, <laughs> to the extent that he dares uh, let's say that. Let's see. There's, um, we've got a little bit of time left in the first hour. Oh, uh, Michael Martino says he's that, uh, uh, Michael uses the M word. I don't think we say that anymore, but, uh, the little person, uh, comedian. Oh, Isaiah is, uh, clarifying something. He says, as for my pony policy, I'm planning on paying everyone nearly the price of a pony monthly on top of any benefits they already may receive. I got my current advisors, and we suspect $1,200 a month would be sufficient. Excellent. So it's like uh, uh, universal uh, basic income, but pony-based. I like that. I like that. Um, yesterday on the Dr. Kevin show, I made reference to this, and then we ran out of time, and... Uh, Jenny brought this up the other day, and we ran out of time, but it's a cool story, so I want to make sure we get this in uh, before we hit the top of the hour and we get to Eric's classic film review. You know, we've been talking a lot, obviously, about Russia and Ukraine, and, um, uh, you know, there's there's a lot lot to chew on there, of course, but the Russians, uh, one of the provocative things that they were doing is um, they had drills 
scheduled, military exercises scheduled for off the coast of Ireland. And, you know, we have uh, we have people who listen online in Ireland, of course. And I am of Irish. I'm Irish and German. So I'm of I'm of Irish heritage. That's why I'm so pale. And uh, so I thought this story was interesting. Jenny brought it up the other day and we never got to it, but I want to tackle it now. Um, it, and it's kind of a cool story. It's a positive story. So these Irish fishermen, uh, this time of year, they go and fish in the waters where the Russians were planning to have their military exercises. And the fishermen said, well, we're going, whether they're going to be there or whether they think they're going to be there or not, you know, we've got mortgages to pay. We've got bills. We're going to make a living like we always do. And we're going to go fish. This is how we make our living. And we're not going to be pushed around by the Russians. You know, I mean, we're a NATO country, damn it. We're, we're you know, we're going to go and fish. And the Russians actually backed down. So this is, um, here's the story from Defense One, DefenseOne.com, how Irish fishermen took on the Russian fleet and won. Um, actually, we'll, let's, we'll come right back to that. Let's grab this call. Hi, welcome to Matt Connerton Unleashed. Who's this? Hey, it's Easy G. Easy G, Eric Gagnon. How are you? Yeah, I'm glad you made it to the studio uh, in uh, one piece because, boy, the Looking out my window here, everything's all ice. Mm-hmm. There's a car outside. It's, it's a sheet of ice, the whole car. The whole car is a sheet of ice? Yeah. This way they thought the uh, WWE couldn't get any more stupid. They're, uh, they're going to say, uh, why don't we give Goldberg one more match against Roman Reigns? I know. You hate it. Does that it. seem like a good match to you, um, Matt? You hate it when the old guys come back. It'll be a short match. Goldberg is... Elimination Chamber, Saudi Arabia. Goldberg is 55 years old. Um, here's I the, know. They, yeah. He has one more match in his contract, I guess, so they figured they, they would give, give him a, 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 one more match. I mean, do we, does he really need one more match? I, I, I have to say no. Well, he wants that big payday, I'm sure, and he is still a draw. He wrestled against the uh, big, big uh, yeah, Bobby Lashley, and he hurt himself. By the way, did you know, see, the thing is, we can make all the criticisms we want to, but the truth is, WWE, did you know they just had their most uh, profitable quarter ever? Yeah, I sent you that, that message, yeah. Yes. Okay, so yeah, a billion dollars. Yep, yep. Their deal with Peacock apparently it must be because is, of all those wrestlers they, uh, they fired. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that helps. Uh, but also, they're... Uh, they're the, uh, the, uh, uh, a lot of those guys didn't make, uh, girls didn't make a lot of money anyway. Right, but their deal with Peacock also has uh, apparently improved their viewership of their uh, premium events, which, of course, used to be called pay-per-views exponentially. They're Goldberg doing phenomenal. Goldberg is 55 years old. You know, it's, it's time for him to retire permanently. I hope they don't give him another contract. I mean, couldn't they give it a, a match to, to uh, somebody else? He's a big star. I don't he, know who, but... He's still a big star. I know Drew McIntyre is kind of banged up with his neck, so mm -hmm. maybe they're going to give it to him, but he's injured a lot. So, well, you know, wrestling fans, we uh, well, most of us anyway. You don't like it when the old guys come back, but most of us, you know, we like a little bit of nostalgia. We like to see some old guys come back once in a while. Yeah, there was there was a rumor that they say, "Oh, let's give Undertaker one more match." But he, he's all done. The yeah. only reason he was there at the Royal Rumble because his, his wife Michelle McCool was in the Royal Rumble. Yes. I mean, you know, they got another crazy match, too. Uh, Lita's going to fight uh, Becky Lynch. So who do you think is going to win that match? <laughs> Lita versus Becky Lynch? Lita hasn't wrestled a match in a yeah. ton of years. Well, how old is Lita? I think that uh, Elimination Chamber is going to be a going to be a bust. Mm-hmm. Well, we know Shane McMahon won't be in it. Going to be a bust. Well, at least they're, at least they're allowing a... a uh, some uh, woman to wrestle because I know in Saudi Arabia they wouldn't allow WWE to have any woman wrestlers come to town. Yeah, they gotta ease that in. I so guess. That, I guess that's a good sign. I don't know. I don't, as far as I know, there's only one woman's match. Yeah, I but think anyways. the I think the last time they were in Saudi, they they had one woman's. But I wonder. Match. I wonder how much, how much money uh, Goldberg will have for that. Uh, his return. I bet. I bet he makes a pretty penny. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean that's why he, he doesn't come right? back. You know, for uh, ten cents on a dollar. He's coming back for a big payday. No, those uh, Saudi matches, uh, you know, the, the big names, they get like a million bucks just to go have a match. Anyways, I'll let you go. I know you got the uh, the, the uh, movie review, so I'm going to yes. let you go. All right, Eric. Thank you for the call, my friend.
All right, that is EZG, our retired entertainment reporter. Uh, let's see, before we run out of time on this uh, segment. So uh, this is from Defense One, how Irish fishermen took on the Russian fleet and won. The action illustrates how the private sector can help governments respond to Russian gray zone aggression. Um, so it explains it. Whoop. Sorry, I just uh, clicked something. I Oh, what happened here? Let me get back to that article. I clicked something and then I clicked something else. And uh, here we go. Uh, for months, years, in fact, uh, the learned men and women in the corridors of Western powers have been putting their heads together to stop Russia from acting provocatively. Think tankers uh, such as me. Uh, this is uh, Elizabeth Bra who wrote this. She's a uh, senior fellow at AEI. Um, think tankers such as me have written endless op-eds, reports, and books for the same purpose. We have, alas, been depressingly unsuccessful. A few days ago, another group altogether showed how it's done. When Russia announced its intention to conduct a naval exercise off the coast of Ireland, Irish fishermen came up with a deterrent so surprising and so powerful that the Russian Navy moved the exercise. We should learn from them. Last Sunday, the government of Ireland passed the word that starting on February 3, Russia would hold a naval exercise in Ireland's exclusive economic zone. Irish officials declared the exercise, quote, not welcome and not wanted, unquote, but had clearly been unable to convince their Russian counterparts to hold it elsewhere. Indeed, despite continuing to plead with Russia to move the exercise, noting, for example, the area's unique marine wildlife, the Irish government got nowhere. As Russia's amb ambassador to Ireland, Yuri Fil Fil Filatov, Filatov, I'm sure I butchered that, said last week, quote, Yuri is a cool name, though. I like Russian names, Yuri. Yuri, Andre, Vladimir. Vladimir, not so much because of Putin. Uh, anyway, but uh, Yuri, we'll just call him Yuri, said, quote, There is nothing to be disturbed, concerned, or anguished about, and I have extensively explained that to our Irish colleagues, unquote. The exercise was terrible news for Ireland's fishermen, who stood to lose one million tons of fishery, said Patrick Murphy, the chief executive of the Irish South and West Fish Producers Organization. Murphy told RTE Radio, quote, This is the livelihoods of fishermen and fishing families all around the coastline here. It's our waters. Can you imagine if the Russians were applying to go into the mainland of Ireland to go launching rockets? How far would they get with that? Unquote. Murphy said the fishermen would be making a coordinated effort to head off the Russian fleet. Uh, he said on January 25th, quote, Our boats will be going out to that area on the 1st of February to go fishing. When our boat needs to return to port, another will head out, so there is a continuous presence on the water. If that is in proximity to where the military exercise is going, we are expecting that the Russian naval services abide by the anti-collision regulations, unquote. By constantly having their boats in the exercise waters, the fishermen would peacefully prevent the Russians from conducting the exercise. Their action worked. On January 29, Filatov issued a statement announcing that Russia's defense minister, Sergei Sho Shoigu, Shoigu? <laughs> had decided, quote, as a gesture of goodwill to relocate the exercises by the Russian Navy planned for February 3 to 8 outside the Irish exclusive economic zone with the aim not to hinder fishing activities by the Irish vessels in the traditional fishing areas, unquote. The Irish fishermen didn't just humiliate Moscow. They also put Western Capital's deterrence efforts to shame. And they did so by announcing asymmetric deterrence. The Irishmen would clearly not be able to sail to key Russian fishing waters to take revenge by harming fish there, and doing so would have at any rate been provocative. But they could go to their peaceful business in the Irish EEZ in such large numbers that the Russians would struggle to carry out their exercise. It was an action more creative than the threats Western governments typically think up, and that creativity created such a surprise factor that the Russians had to back down. 
So the article goes on a, a little bit more. It's 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 um it, it's a little uh, lengthy, but I just wanted to get the gist of that across. So that's what we were talking about the other day when uh, Jenny brought it up, and then it also came up last night uh, during my appearance on the Dr. Kevin show, and then we just ran out of time. But that's such a cool story, and uh, good for them. By the way, hello to Chris Rose from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts who joins us in the Facebook live chat. Nemi says, badass. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. We are at the top of the hour. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to Eric Pilcher's classic film review. And this week, Eric reviewed In the Heat of the Night, the film starring Sidney Portier and Rod Steiger, a personal favorite of mine. Like I said, definitely in my top five. This month, uh, Eric is reviewing films appropriate for Black History Month. And uh, I was thrilled when he told me he had chosen to do In the Heat of the Night. So let's uh, check this out. I think you'll enjoy it. And then we will show some love to our amazing sponsors. And then we will be back with the remainder well in hour number two of Matt Connerton Unleashed. So don't go anywhere. Plenty more to come. On your feet, boy. I mean now. Got a name, boy? Virgil Tips. Virgil. Where you come from? There ain't no trains this time of morning. I could have had you shot. Skulls caved in. Could have been a hitchhiker. I got him. Where's my husband? I thought I told you to get the hell out of here. You aren't taking me anywhere. You dig? You go get yourself killed. I'm a police officer. Look, they pay you $162.39 a week just to look at bodies. Why can't you look at this one? Why can't you look at it for yourself? I do not want that Negro officer taken off this case. I need a few things. Such as ammonium hydrosulfide, benzidine, superoxide of hydrogen, copper powder, distilled water, calibers and some toothpicks. Why won't anybody here tell me what's happened to it? Are you sure you're pregnant? Yes, I am pregnant. I can pull that fat cat down. I'm afraid you're a little late, Virgil. We already got the guilty man. May I examine this person? Yeah, you can look at him. Come on, let him look. He's left-handed, isn't he? What's that make him? Innocent. I got the motive, which is money, and the body, which is death. You're holding the wrong man. But don't you push me, boy. They call me Mr. Tibbs. What kind of people are you? was a time of change for the United States of America. The country was still at war in Vietnam. Music was becoming an anthem of unrest, and racial tensions were high. All of these things were also being brought forth in motion pictures. This week's film is a taut, vibrant, suspenseful display of those tensions that will leave a lasting impression. Directed by Norman Jewison, In the Heat of the Night tells the tale of a murder in a small town. The man murdered is bringing a new plant to the area and his wife pressures the city to find the culprit. This brings together an unlikely pairing with African-American Philadelphia detective Virgil Tibbs. Sidney Poitier plays him and delivers a dynamite performance and bigoted police chief Gillespie who is played by Rod Steiger in his Academy Award winning role. When these two first meet we see the clash of Gillespie's Old South way of thinking and Tibbs refusal to quote unquote fall in line with the town's racist views. The 
first scene I will present is the first meeting between the two. And the second scene features Tibbs questioning Gillespie on arresting a suspect for the murder, albeit an erroneous arrest. This scene also features one of the most well-known lines in cinema history. I was visiting my mother. I came in on the 1235 from Brownsville. I was waiting to go out on the 405. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Meanwhile, you just killed yourself a white man, just about the most important white man we got around here, and picked yourself up a couple of hundred dollars. I earned that money, 10 hours a day, seven days a week. Colored can't earn that kind of money, boy. Hell, that's more than I make in a month. Now, where did you earn it? Philadelphia. Mississippi? Pennsylvania. Uh, just what do you do up there in little old Pennsylvania, earn that kind of money? I'm a police officer. Before you brought him in? No, sir. Do you mind taking a look at that? Yeah! Oh, yeah! And now, our second clip. The bird's here, Chief. He thinks that Harvey's innocent. <laughs> well, I'll be damned. Could I talk to you about it in private? No, you can't talk to me about it in privacy because I got Cobert's wallet right here in my hand. We took it from Harvey Overs. You don't think he gave it to him, do you? I don't know, but Overs could have come along after the crime, found it, picked it up. I don't know. That's what the boy said he did. Well, I'm sorry, man, but I said different. Well, when I examined the deceased, it was obvious that the fatal blow was struck from an angle of 17 degrees from the right, which makes it almost certain the person who did it is right-handed. So what? Old Harv's left-handed, Chief. Everybody in town knows that. Yeah, uh, that, that's what we figured out, Chief. Uh, Harvey's a lefty, uh-huh. Well, you're pretty sure of yourself, ain't you, Virgil? Uh, Virgil, that's a funny name for it, but it comes from Philadelphia. What do they call you up there? They call me Mr. Tibbs. Mr. Tibbs! Well, Mr. Wood, take Mr. Tibbs, take him down to the depot, and I mean boy like now. Have the FBI lab send you the report on this. Not that it'll make any difference. I'll take that. I hope you won't. I'm sending it in personally. dead. Somebody in this town killed him. I want you to find out who. Even following this interaction, we find Tibbs still trying to get respect from this town. And he feels the only way he can do it is bring this murderer to justice. Even after the mayor demands that Gillespie work with Tibbs due to the aforementioned slain businessman's wife demanding he stay on the case under the threat of moving the factory from the town. This leads to the unlikely duo questioning a plantation owner named Endicott whose racist views are on full display. Here... Tibbs stands up to him and, in a way, stands up to the town because Endicott holds the town's ideals and is, is a great poster child for those ideals. He slaps Endicott 
right after Endicott strikes him. And it's important to note the shock in Endicott's voice after it occurs. Why'd you two come here? To ask you about Mr. Colbert. Let me understand this. You two came here to question me? Well, your... Your attitudes, Mr. Endicott, your points of view are a matter of record. Some people, well, let us say the people who work for Mr. Colbert might reasonably regard you as the person least likely to mourn his passing. We were just trying to clarify some of the evidence. Was Mr. Colbert ever in this greenhouse, say, last night about midnight? Good, that's me. Yeah. You saw it. Well, I saw it. What are you going to do about it? I don't know. I'll remember that. There was a time when I could have had you shot. Well, clear out, and I mean fast. What about that big speech you gave me this morning? I didn't know you were going to slap any white man, least of all Endicott. All right, give me another day. Two days, I'm close. I can pull that fat cat down. I can bring him right off this hill. Oh, boy. Man, you're just like the rest of us. Ain't you? This is a film that truly deserves every accolade it has and will receive. It was nominated for an astounding seven Academy Awards in winning five, including Best Picture and Best Supporting Actor, as I mentioned previously, for Rob Steiger's performance. Despite the wins, to me, Sidney Poitier was a glaring omission. He wasn't even nominated for his groundbreaking, rich, and powerful performance as Virgil Tibbs. This film has left a lasting impact on popular culture, the arts, and society. It spawned two sequels. It also ended up being a very successful TV series from the late 80s to the early 90s. To have this film as a starting point for Black History Month is a no-brainer. This film to me is flawless. Everything works and everything gels together. The music, the story, the performances, and the message all deliver and will leave a lasting impact on anyone who will watch it. I would like to invite everyone to join me next week as I review Steve McQueen's 12 Years a Slave as we continue our Black History Month theme for the month of February. For Matt Connerton Unleashed, this has been a classic film review with Eric Pilcher. In the heat of the night Seems like a cold sweat creeping across my brow Yeah In the heat of the night I'm feeling motherless the 
skies all mean and bright in the heat of the Welcome back. We are well in our number two numero dos of Matt Connerton Unleashed. And we are live from the studios of WMNH 95.3 FM in downtown Manchester, New Hampshire. Also on Comcast 97 if you're in Manchester. And hello to all of our online listeners across the nation and around the globe. You can go to my website, mattconnerton.com, for all of your live streaming options, social media links, contact info, show archives, etc., etc. It is Friday, February 4, 2022. And I uh, hope everyone is uh, safe and sound where you are uh, here in uh, New Hampshire, of course. It's uh, it's quite a wintry mix, as they say, with snow and ice, and uh, it's it's not uh, it's not good. Looks like they're doing a lot out here on Elm Street, certainly to clear the roads, and I'm sure they're doing that all over the place. But uh, uh, you know, I hope everyone's um, just uh, be safe, take it easy, don't be in a hurry if you're out and about driving in this, and you know, it should be. Should be uh, all uh, cleaned up overnight. They are. Um, they did declare, if you're in Manchester, they did declare a snow emergency again for tonight, second night in a row, as they work to uh, to clean all of this up. So if you're driving, which uh, most of you listening are, uh, please take your time. Uh, I do want to remind you, of course, we are proudly sponsored by the Hop Knot. However, don't go there this evening. They're actually closed today because of the weather, and I'm sure a lot of businesses downtown uh, here have been today so nasty out but um yeah they they probably wouldn't have been doing much much business i went over there earlier because the post office is in the same building and we have a you know for uh for the business we have a post office box over there and uh man there was just really hardly anybody downtown so um yeah so the hop knot is closed but they will be open tomorrow so they've got the delicious gourmet pretzels they've got the assortment of craft beer wonderful place and i'm hoping to get kenny in here uh on one of these days on a monday uh, you know, the Hop Knot is a black-owned business, and it is Black History Month, and it'd be great to have uh, have a conversation with Kenny uh, about that before the month is up. So, uh, But he's a busy guy, so you know, always, always trying to, to prod him into to getting in here, but uh, but we do love the Hop Knot. Uh, if you'd like to call us today, 603-250-6007 is the number, 603-250-6007. You can also text me at 617-917-4476. Tweet me at Matt Connerton or send an email to Matt at MattConnerton.com. And, of course, you can always interact and opine in the Facebook live chat. But the best thing to do so that we can hear and enjoy your dulcet tones is to give us a call at 603-250-6007. It is Friday, so there's a lot that goes on here at WMNH 95.3 on Fridays. Coming up immediately after this show, as far as I know, he's coming in. Uh, Rob Azevedo will be here for Granite State of Mind. Uh, great show uh, every week. Usually he um, actually he pops in a little bit early, too, so we might see him in a few minutes. Usually he uh, comes in and, and sits in on the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes of this program, and we have a conversation. So I always look forward to that. Rob's a great guy and a great host and does a great show. So Granite State of Mind coming up at 6 p.m. And then tonight at 7.30, the return of Retro Spectrum Radio with Paul E.C. Uh, Paul was out for a couple of weeks with COVID, but he's back and he's ready and um, really looking forward to seeing him. And, you know, it's it's been a couple of weeks. I've missed uh, doing the show with him. So that will be tonight from 7.30 to 10 p.m. Uh, I am one of Paul's co-hosts on that show, along with Dan Randlett and DJ Steve. I don't know what the status is of the other two gentlemen as far as being here because the driving, the road conditions are not great. <laughs> but, you know, we'll see. But uh, I'll be here. And, of course, Paul will be here. And we'll, uh, we'll have a good time, uh, irrespective of 
of who else is here with us. But really looking forward to that. Uh, also, of course, because it is Friday night, uh, don't forget the Charles Richardson show. Jenny, uh, now for a few weeks, I believe, has been uh, one of Charles's co-hosts on that show. That is online uh, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night from 7 to 9 p.m. So uh, you can check that out as well. Uh, Jenny does a great job on that with Charles and the gang. And uh, so lots uh, lots going on. Fridays are, are very, very busy. Speaking about these uh, different programs, by the way, I did want to mention, just um, send out some condolences uh, to uh, uh, Philip D. Blackman, who calls the show occasionally. He's also the host of the uh, the Philip D. Blackman show, but uh, he just lost his father as his dad passed away. So I just wanted to... Um, uh, you know, mention that. And, uh, you know, if, if you're listening, Philip, uh, you know, hope, hope you're doing okay. We communicated a bit earlier, but he, he did just lose his dad. So uh, very sad about that. So he hasn't, he hasn't been able to, to do his show for the past week or so because he was dealing with that, his dad getting sick and then, and then passing away. So uh, let's, uh, let's see. But if you'd like to get in with a call again, 603 250 6007. By the way, everybody in the Facebook live chat really enjoying uh, Eric Pilcher's classic film review. This week, the subject was In the Heat of the Night, one of my absolute all-time favorite films, and uh, Eric does such a great job on those. That's become a, a, a very popular feature here on Matt Connerton Unleashed, so we always uh, look forward to that. Let's see. Um, there's a uh, well, we talked about that. Let's see. There's a few different things. There's a lot going on. And that's the nice thing about doing a show like this, where you talk about politics, is there's always a million things going on. <laughs> um, oh, you know what? We we mentioned the uh, Michael Avenatti thing. Let's put a button on that. Uh, Wayne Noel had uh, shared a link for that in the chat room earlier. Um. Let's see. Here it is. I'm not sure this is uh, I'm not sure if this is the same link that Wayne did, but this is the one that came up for me. Yeah. Uh, the Hill dot com is reporting Michael Avenatti found guilty of stealing thousands from Stormy Daniels. Uh, Michael Avenatti, who represented adult film actress Stormy Daniels in a case against the former President Trump, was found guilty on Friday of stealing thousands of dollars uh, from his one time client. Uh, by the way, Rob Azevedo is here in studio. Hello, Rob. Hello, Matt. How are you? Very good. Very good. Uh, the former attorney to Daniels, whose real name is Stephanie Clifford, was convicted of stealing close to $300,000 that Daniels was set to receive for writing her book, which she discusses, in which she discusses an affair she says she had with Trump. Trump denied the claims. Uh, Avenatti denied that he had committed any wrongdoing. He said in his closing arguments that, oh, so he represented himself, that he was just being paid for his work and there was not sufficient evidence to prove he committed fraud. He said prosecutors had not proven the allegations against him, so he would not testify in his own defense. A judge approved Avenatti's request to represent himself during the trial after he said he had a breakdown with his defense from the Federal Defenders of New York. I guess that's an organization. Or, well, um, it set up an unusual scenario in which Avenatti cross-examined his former client. Daniels hired Avenatti as she sought to get out of a non-disclosure deal regarding the alleged affair weeks before the 2016 presidential election. Avenatti's sentencing is scheduled for May 24, according to CNN. Well, he's, he's rich and, and white. I'm sure he'll end up in club fed. But uh, Michael he's, Avenatti in a lot of broke, trouble. He's broke, dude. He's living on credit. Yeah, well, he um, he was already in all that trouble for uh, uh, trying to extort Nike. Yeah, and he already <laughs> did time, right, for that? I, I believe he's he's been under house arrest. Okay. I don't know if he was actually in a federal facility prior to that. I think he did. I think he did some months. But uh, Probably. He, he's looking at that, and he's looking at another one right after uh, Stormy. Yeah. He's got another uh, suit coming against him. Yeah, he, uh, I'll tell you, he really, uh, <laughs> I was I was only half joking before I was uh, talking about how I, I, for a long time, I thought that he was going to end up with his own show on MSNBC. Right. Because he was on there like every night. Oh, yeah. Talking about he had this, he had that you know, on the Trumps and, and whatnot. And he really talked a big game. Oh, and I almost forgot. And then he announced his candidacy for the presidency. And uh, 
and then and then he ended up in uh, prison. He's gonna do. He's gonna do a. <laughs> he's gonna do a good amount of time. I bet you. Twenty two years is. Uh, I I don't know if he's gonna do twenty two for the Stormy Daniels things, but he could. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. Hey, what did you think about the GOP? Uh, finally, uh, how they described uh, January sixth today. A uh, uh, what was it? A legitimate discourse, political discourse. Oh yes, yes. And when when their uh, their censure of Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney. Yeah, yeah, pretty disgraceful. Um, but not surprising. You know, you know, listening to Trump, you know how he was trying to rile up his people in Texas, like come and uh, protest. You know, if they try to convict me. Yes, I'm going to guarantee January 6 is not going to happen again. Not going to happen. Because I think that the the nitwits who went and did that, right, busted in, I think that they're seeing that uh, the government's just going to come and stomp you. And um, I don't think that, I, I don't really think that anybody's going to come and, uh, you know, I, hang out for Trump again. I hope that you're right. I fear that you're wrong. But I hope that you're right. <laughs> I do. We have we're a, we're dealing with. <laughs> we have a call. Hi, welcome to Matt Connors and Unleashed. Who's this? Hey, it's Easy G. I got a question there for you, uh, Rob Azevedo. Talk to me, baby. They come out with the uh, the list again for the 2022 Hall of Fame, and my and I can't believe it that that um, I, I say this every year, but I don't seem to be the only one on it in his uh, corner. They need to have Paul Schaefer go to the Hall of Fame. All the years he's helped out people, he's had his own bands, he's been the MC over there. Yeah. And he's been so much in the music industry. Of course, he all those years of David Letterman being his band on the show. I think he should he never be gets any recognition. I, I, think, I think you're right, uh, Ease. Um, I think that maybe down the road. What's your opinion? I, I, I kind of agree with you. You know, I mean, I kind of, yeah, I kind of, all those years with Letterman and all those musical acts that he supported. He also, I think he's run the Hall of Fame music, like the production for many, many years as oh, well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he used to be the MC, yeah. Yeah, the MC. He so, always needs to get the shaft. Yeah, I'm with you, though. I don't well, know why. Just getting the shaft for now, you know what I mean? Um, you know, you know, There's so many people in the Hall of Fame that, you know, and they would think they would have a, uh, a slot for him. Yeah, no, there's a lot of people that nothing. aren't. I hate to go through the list of people who are not in the Hall of Fame, and that's pretty wild. But, uh, you know, and, and yet the Foo Fighters. Uh, are the Foo Fighters in the Hall of Fame? Are, are, yes, I believe that is, so. That's utterly ridiculous. Way too early. Really? You think so? Utterly, utterly ridiculous. Oh, I disagree. I know that you're a big fan. I, 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 I don't a, know, man. I'm a, I'm a casual fan, but I, I think they should be in. You really don't think so? Wow. You think you're going to put Foo Fighters on the same list as Kiss? Well, in terms well, that's of... That's my two cents. So uh, yeah. right, Thanks, right, right, Sorry, right. I'm getting all fired right, up thank you. I better take this right, Bye-bye. Well, no, Kiss should have been in long before they were. But sure. um, but in terms of, I mean, Foo Fighters, probably one of the top five biggest bands in the world for for at least maybe a decade, decade and a half. I think so, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. To be that successful, yeah. Oh, yeah. They've got a lot of hits. They're one of those bands where it's easy to forget how many actual hit songs they have mm-hmm. unless you look online and look at a list, and yeah. it's like, wow, they've got a lot of hits. I guess you're right. I, I guess you're right. I, I'm not... <laughs> I, well, I'm not a big Dave Grohl fan. I'm not a big Foo Fighter fan, and I like that kind of music too. But that's yeah. maybe that's just why I can't. I don't get it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't think Grohl has a really great uh, voice. I don't think he's that an exceptional drummer. I mean, I think he's a good drummer. Hmm. Um, definitely not a exceptional guitar player. I mean, is his songs, is his lyrics that, you know? Yeah. I don't know. I, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just not impressed. I think they should be in. Yeah, I'm I, with you, Matt. You know music. You know music better than me. So uh, oh, I don't I'll know about you. I don't know about that. I would. I wouldn't. Well, uh, I would. But uh, j- by the way, so this is from rawstory.com. Um, this is what you were talking about, Rob. It yeah. says here, uh, the Republican National Committee on Friday passed a resolution censuring representatives Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger for participating in the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th Capitol riots. While the resolution censor, uh, censuring the two Republicans had been widely reported, the actual text of the resolution still managed to shock many journalists. Specifically, the resolution accused Cheney and Kinzinger of participating um, in the, uh, oh, sorry, in, uh, of participating in the, quote, persecution of ordinary citizens yeah. engaged in legitimate political discourse, uh, unquote. You're an idiot. 
The sense, uh, the sentence sickened MSNBC host Chris Hayes, who wrote on Twitter that, quote, the RNC resolution is actually considerably worse and more debased than I had anticipated, unquote. Yeah. Uh, the New Republic's Matt Ford was simply dumbstruck by the text of the resolution. He wrote, quote, nothing insightful or clever to add here, just that we're in an incredibly dark place and it's going to get worse, unquote. No, it's going to get so much brighter when Trump, I really do think he, it's going to be unprecedented, but I think they're going to lock him up over the next three years. Well, that'd be, that'd be quite a sight. Yep. I don't know. Sure. Well, I, I, and it's, 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 easy to, it's easy to say, I don't know, right? Because yeah, yeah. Who, how on earth do you lock up a U.S. president? Right. You lock up that man. That's the most dangerous man in the United States. That idiot. That that well, idiot in the eight from the eighties, that idiot from the nineties, that <laughs> idiot from the two thousands with a horrible television show, and that idiot as a president. When you say horrible television show, I just want to be clear. Uh, are, do you mean uh, Apprentice? Uh, but what about Celebrity Apprentice? That's what I'm talking about. Both. I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to say. <laughs> you know. I don't know. You know. He, he. You know. He. I'm a big Stern fan. Oh, me he too. Used yeah. to, now I know the uh, Celebrity Apprentice did very well in the ratings, right? I don't know. See, he did the same thing on Stern. He would talk about how uh, how great The Apprentice was. No other show in the history of shows right. have ever. It's the exact same um, rapport that he did with his as a president. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? If yeah. I say it enough, somebody's going to believe it. Right. And I'm, first, uh, he'll believe it. Yeah. The show wasn't the greatest show in the history. It what didn't have the highest ratings in the history of television, but he would say it over and over right. and over. Right. When he wasn't talking about uh, all the women that he banged or how many different wives he's banged of famous uh, celebrities. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, he's good at uh, marketing. You know, he's, I mean, that's his uh, strength. He's good at marketing and branding of Trump. That's that's what he's good at. Almost to his detriment. It's gonna it's gonna bite him. Howard Stern said to him, I remember, he said, What are you gonna why are you running for president? This is gonna come back and bite you. Yeah. And it's gonna come back and I mean, New York gonna come back and bite him. Yep. I hope yep. his kids get locked up. I I hope he gets to watch those kids get locked up. That would be something. That could be a reality show. Well, yeah. it'll just be on the news, I guess. But uh Yeah, yeah. Hey, um, how was the drive over for you? I don't think the DPW trucks are out yet. Uh, pretty sloppy. Yeah. Really yeah. sloppy. Went slow. I mean, I left my house. I usually leave at 5. I said, I better get out of here about 20 of. Yeah, I did the same thing. I got here early. I, well, I was lucky. <clears> so uh, the, the drive over here was, um, geez, when did I leave? Like 2.15. I usually don't leave till almost 3. I do because, I, you know, I do the bulk of my show prep at home. Mm -hmm. But um, when I when I drove over, it was, yeah, it was, the roads were greasy. Yeah. But as soon as I parked the car in the garage and I'm headed to the building, all of a sudden the, the uh, freezing rain started up again. Yeah. So my timing was perfect. I got here right before that started sure. again. Yeah. What do you go over? Victory? You park in Victory? Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. It doesn't even cost anything, does it? Uh, it does, but I have a parking pass. Oh, okay. If, if you have a parking pass, it doesn't, but the station gave me a, gave me a parking pass. So, oh, that reminds me, there's a new key here for you. Oh, good. Yeah. I was looking for that. So, um, what do you have uh, coming up on the show tonight? Another new guest on GSM. Uh, first time guy named Sage Ryder. Now, my first question to this kid is, did you come out of the shoot with that name? Because <laughs> it is a cool name. Th that's a cool name. Yeah, you were yeah. either going to be a cowboy or a rock and roll star. So, uh, yeah, I, I saw a little video of him playing down at um, uh, Strange Brew a few weeks ago. And I said, I got to get this dude. So, yeah, he's coming in, I think, with two of his buddies. And then he has a gig over at the strange brew tonight from nine to one so looking forward to meeting him and going to play some tunes uh some new stuff and what else yeah that's what we're doing yeah retro spectrum radio returns tonight as that's well good. yeah good. yeah paulie c you know he had covid but mm -hmm. uh so he you know he was out for a couple of weeks yeah. but but uh yeah when he called he called into the show the other day he sounded great you know so we're not sure if the other gentlemen who usually join us on uh on friday nights are going to be here or not with the driving conditions as right. such but uh yeah whatever it, what what ended up happening with your um because you're i remember when we had that little ice storm yeah. there where everything just kind of froze like instantly I, crashed. Oh, I remember that did yeah. you did you get your car fixed or oh, did yeah. you oh, i okay. just had them um I, again three hundred and twenty thousand miles on this wow. car now and i'm going to 400 i just had them bolt the uh bolt the bumper back on 
Yeah, yeah. And I had them, you know, they said, well, you have no real damage to mechanically. I said, okay, bolt the bumper back on. Let's go. Yeah, because I remember you saying the insurance company tried to make you total it. Yeah, to, well, yeah. <laughs> they didn't even contact me and say they were coming to pick my car up to total it. I was like, what are you doing? Right, no, right. this baby, you don't understand. We have history. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Uh, by the way, uh, hello to Charles Richardson in the uh, Charles Richardson show, uh, from the Charles Richardson show. That'll be on tonight, 7 to 9 p.m. online. Uh, Jenny is a co-host on that, although they, there seems to be some sort of, uh, I'm not sure what's going on in the chat room with that. I kind of, whoa, boy. Um, I don't know what's going on in here or if people are kidding around or if there's a legitimate beef. I'll have to look at that later. Um, Whatever it is, it's good radio. Y- well, not exactly because it's in the chat room. <laughs> oh, it, oh, true. Okay. Did you hear, uh, speaking of, uh, did you hear EZG's latest scandal, though? No, I was going to just talk. I wanted some uh, NHN rumor mill stuff. What's going on? Yeah, so he was supposed to be, well, so he was on the show, was it, yeah, it must have been, yeah, Monday. Uh-huh. Monday, he was on my show. He hadn't been on in a long time, so he came on, and it was a surprise. Well, apparently, uh, he was supposed to be on the morning show Tuesday morning. Mm-hmm. So uh, Peter White, and that was supposed to be a surprise. So uh, Peter, uh, I guess, uh, texted or messaged Eric and said, uh, oh, because I had posted something about we have a surprise today on my show. Mm-hmm. So I guess Peter saw that. So he messaged Eric and said, uh, are you going on Matt's show today? Mm-hmm. And Eric said, yeah. And he's like, well, then you don't have to come on tomorrow on my show because oh. it was ruining the surprise. Oh, that must have crushed him. And I wasn't even sure if, um, you know, if Peter was serious or, you know, if he was doing a bit. But, oh, apparently, yeah. but apparently he was serious because Eric was not uh, Eric was not there uh, Tuesday morning. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So so he has a new scandal. So. so does Pete not like him fraternizing with other shows? It's not that. Yeah. It's not that. Because, you know, Peter's not like that. But, no. I, but I think it just, uh, you know, it ruined the surprise. It was supposed, the return of EZG. I mean, that's a that's a main event in any mm. arena in the country. You and know? How, how did he do? What did he have to, entertainment report? No, he just came in and. Uh, Hung out? Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we, we had a, a phone guest for the first, like, hour and 15 minutes of the show. So then we took a break and then we got caught up with EZG. And, uh, you know, just a low-key thing. Yeah. But um, but uh, I I guess his appearance on the morning show was supposed to be a surprise, and he blew he mm-hmm. he spoiled the surprise. That's no good. So we have a new scandal. And, Easy. And, and when you think of, I mean, it's almost hard to keep track of all of his scandals and public humiliations. You know, <laughs> know. You've, you've got Taco Gate. Yeah. You've got Tablet Gate. Yeah. Those I think are the two biggest. I guess maybe this is ruined it's, Surprise Gate or yeah, something. Yeah. Or, yeah. I I don't know. Uh, I don't know exactly what to call it, but. Uh, I have yeah. a question for you. Yes. Big. Now, when somebody, we, we have talked about in the past how when you get a, ra- a radio spot, you hold on to it for dear life mm-hmm. because there are so few. Yeah. Die on. The weekly die on is done for now. Who is going to try to take that Thursday 6 o'clock slot? Mm. Is Gonzo gunning for it? Ooh. You know he's gunning for it. No, I don't think he is, and I'll tell you why. Because the rumor now, I haven't heard this from him directly, but uh, but I but I guess it's okay to say it because it's been spoken about openly on Peter's show. The rumor is he's moving to Texas. Really? Yeah, huh. because his wife got offered a promotion or a, a transfer to Texas or something. So God, you build up these all these years mm-hmm. of of, of uh, Crete Stred over here at the station, mm-hmm. and then oh, that's another. That's a hit. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Maybe maybe Kyle will uh, Kyle Clayton will uh, have his own uh, show once a week. Well, who or, knows, right? I don't know I because don't know. now it's open and there were no slots to take. Right. Um. Yeah. Who knows? But Ben did a great job, man. He was so yeah. thorough. He had me. He was very thankful to had me on the show a couple of times. Oh yeah, he did a great job. Yeah, he did. Yeah. No, we'll miss him, and you know, it's it's not necessarily forever. I mean, he's leaving on good terms. Oh yeah. So it, it's certainly possible that he'll be back. And you know, he did his show as a a podcast before coming to WMNH. So in theory, I mean, I don't know if he's considered it. Um, and I I didn't get a chance to ask him the other day when he was here, but you know, he could he could always just do the show as a podcast where he's not. On a set schedule, yeah, you know, not doing it live every week, which might be easier for him to work in because he's got a lot going on, yeah. Um, you know, uh, and but yeah, I mean, he's 
clearly can't be here every Thursday. He was missing a lot of Thursday nights. So. I wonder what they're going to fill that spot with. What are they going to put in there? Reruns for or, a while? Or, or, or? May, maybe nothing. Maybe it'll just be, you know, more uh, more music or another replay of another show. Yeah. I've, I haven't heard a thing. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe they'll give me a third hour. Maybe. Maybe. You could pull it off. That wouldn't scare you, would it? No, not at all. I've done it a couple of, of times. Uh, there, there's there been two instances I don't remember why the first one happened. The second one happened because there was some sort of a mishap with Ben's show. And Peter said, do you want to do a third hour today? You know, like he texted me during the show and yep. said, hey, there's something, something's wrong. Like Ben's, Ben had a replay, but it wasn't loaded into the system or something. And Peter said, do you want to do a third hour? I said, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's easy to do with a show like this, you know, because it's, there's always plenty going on. To talk about, you oh, know, yeah. and, and a lot of political talk shows on uh, terrestrial radio are three hours or even four hours. You make it look easy, though. Oh, you thank and you. Pete. You really do. You make it look real easy. Well, we're we're, we're blessed with uh, the skills, I guess. Yeah. Well, really for me, do. for do me, a it's, job. it's like it's I think I just find it easy because, you know, like I said, it's when it's politics, it's this always a million things going on, you know, mm-hmm. sports talk is like that too. Like I, I think, I mean, I'm not a sports guy, but I've just noticed that that's also, that's also another talk radio format that lends itself to being able to, you know, do a show. Nothing. For, you're, you're always going to have something to talk. About. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. There's always something going on. I mean, maybe, maybe not so much when COVID was at its height in the mm-hmm. beginning when they shut everything down, but, right. but even then they, you know, these uh, guys, these uh, sports talk guys would still, find ways to uh, fill the time yep. or not all guys, but there's, I mean, there's one, there's uh, Amy Lawrence who does uh, uh, a, a four hour uh, sports talk show overnights. She's from uh, New Hampshire. Yeah. Con- where, Concord, what, New it, Hampshire. What, yeah. Uh, well, I've never heard of her. Amy Lawrence, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is it a podcast or a radio show? No radio show. She's, oh. uh, she's on CBS radio. I think she's on like uh 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. She does oh, overnights. The time. only reason I know that is because I used to listen to, uh, even though I'm not a sports guy, for a while, I, I would listen to Scott Farrell. Oh, yeah. Because, Scotty. yeah. Oh, you do a good impression oh, yeah. of him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Kyle yeah. Evie does a really good impression. Oh, Ky- yeah. Kyle nails him perfectly, but yours is pretty good, too. Yeah. I used to love Farrell. And, you know, when he was talking about sports, I didn't even, like, it didn't matter that I didn't know what he was talking about. I just loved right, right, listening right, right. to him. I could listen to him read the phone book yeah. and be entertained. You know, he was so I, good. I loved how he had music playing over the show the whole time. You know what I mean? He oh, would yeah. Have, yeah, 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 yeah. He's fantastic. Oh, yeah. Nemi knows uh, Amy Lawrence. Uh, Nemi Jones in the chat. Yeah, uh, so so I would hear the beginning of Amy Lawrence's show because if I was up late, I would listen to Scott Farrell. Yeah. And um, that's the only reason I know about her. And then I found out, oh, she's from Concord. Mm-hmm. She's, and I, I grew up in Concord. I, I probably oh, met her did? at some point. You yeah. Grew up, you go to Concord High? Or, yes. Uh, yeah, very yep. nice. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. Oh, yeah. I'm not, a, I'm not a Manchester guy originally. Me neither. I mean, I've been here since, what, 2014? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we will uh, we'll begin to wrap up because you've got your show coming up. Yeah. And uh, I imagine your guests will be arriving shortly and you got to get them set up and everything. Any news, by the way, on your, uh, your venue? Not yet. Not yet. They're making a decision. We, we, I've got great counsel. Um, and, uh, we, we just told them, Hey, this is the deal. And you know, we'll be waiting for your decision and we'll assume if we don't hear from you by this date that it's a go, mm-hmm. which is going to be a go. Yeah. Regardless. I yeah. mean, you, I don't think you can tell me whether I can have people at my house. Right. Right. I'm not selling booze, not selling food, is donation it, based. Right. I mean, what yeah. are you going to do? Yeah. You know, if they don't like the name of Pembroke City Limits, that's just the name of my barn. People name their boats. I just name my barn. That's true. You know what I mean? That's true. Yeah. So, but nothing yet. But for me, March 26th will be the first uh, date and we're going to be doing a Grateful Dead tribute show. It's a gathering, not a concert. Right, right. <laughs> it's just a gathering, yep. not a concert. Everything's going to work out. It's funny. I've been getting texts about that. And, um, yeah, well, it's just going to go on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, just got to work through this city stuff. Yeah. Not trying to make enemies. Uh, of course, yeah. Well, you know? from what you told me, too, it sounds like the town is, they're not being unreasonable. No, they're not, no, no, no. They're not like. They saw an article, and they, they, you know, I understand. They read an article. They say, oh, he's got a music venue going on, uh, and they probably thought I had booze and a whole like cash bar and mm-hmm. but i just wanted to do it under the radar so i wouldn't have to pay which is none of you know i always pay my bills and my taxes so yeah no, i'm just having people in my barn yeah yeah 
Oh, there you go. Yeah. No, I'm sure it'll work out. No, that's good. That's good. That sounds encouraging. And what what is the uh, first show again? Grateful Dead Tribute oh. Show. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. so we're going to do that. And I'm not even a big fan, but um, a lot of people are, so. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Great. All right. Well, that sounds good. Thank you. Well, everybody, make sure you stick around. Uh, coming up next at 6 p.m. right here at WMNH, Rob Azevedo with Granite State of Mind. And then don't forget, tonight at 7.30 is the return of Retro Spectrum Radio with Paul E.C. Really looking forward to that. That's going to be a lot of fun. And I'm glad I don't have to go anywhere for a few hours because uh, I'm sure it's still, I can see it. it's coming down. Now it's uh, it's turned from freezing rain back to snow. Uh, yay. <laughs> If you miss any part of today's show, it will be up in just a little bit at WMNHradio.org and at my website, MattConnerton.com. And uh, thank you all. Rob is next, and I will talk at you all, uh, well, around 730. I'll see you then.